Can't tell if I'm muted. I'm muted. I can't tell if I'm muted. Can you hear me? You're not muted. No. Hopefully it's not coming. There's, it's not a touch screen. Go ahead, Martha. We recognize that CVUUS gathers on land seized from the Western Abenaki people by European colonizers. We respect the Abenaki's spiritual relationship to the land and waters of the Champlain Valley. We are committed to building a peaceful and more just relationship with them and to promoting knowledge about their history and culture. story, wherever the source of your faith, you are welcome here. We at the Champlain Valley Unitarian Universalist Society invite you to settle in, whether it's your first time here or you've been away for a while and are back, or you're here all the time, welcome. If you are new, we invite you to look down in the chat at the bottom of your Zoom screen to find our brand new virtual guest book. There you may introduce yourself and sign up for a copy of our monthly newsletter. Also, be sure to stay right where you are after the service for our Zoom coffee social hour so we can get to know you better. My name is Martha Fulda, a member of this congregation and your worship associate today. I join our settled minister, the Reverend Barnaby Feeder, on our virtual chancel this morning. Acknowledgements go also to Richard Hopkins, Abby Sessions, and Rich Wolfson for technical support, as well as to Mary Hadley for setting up the virtual guest book on chat. 
This very busy congregation offers numerous pathways to connection between Sundays. Join the CVUUS Race in America book group in discussing Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent by Isabel Wilkerson on the fourth Wednesdays, January through April via Zoom at 7 p.m. starting this coming Wednesday, January 26th, led by Mike Greenwood and Jean Twilliger. Let Mike know so he can add you to his list for discussion questions and Zoom links. More information and contact details are available at cvuus.org slash news. The Vermont Office of the U.S. Committee on Refugees and Immigration is planning to settle about 100 Afghan refugees in the Rutland area in the near future. Rutland welcomes, organized five years ago when Syrian refugees were expected, and the organization has remained active. They're collecting furnishings and supplies for the new Afghan households. If you're interested in helping to gather the needed household items, you can work directly with Rutland Welcomes or contact Abbey Sessions. Complete details, contact information, and a spreadsheet listing items needed are all at cvuus.org slash news. Abby tells us that they have a person going to Rutland on Tuesday, February 1st, willing to deliver whatever items you can donate. Please contact her for pickup details. Now, please sit back and hear the words of our call to worship by Martha Kirby Capo. As we enter this shared sacred space, let us renew both our commitment and our covenant. There are those among us who have endured a loss in the past week. May their hope be uplifted again in this community of faith. May they find renewed strength. There are those among us who have wrestled with questions that seem to have no answer this past week. May they find sanctuary in this community of faith. There are those among us who have cherished an unexpected joy in this past week. May their gladness be celebrated. As we commit to continue our free and responsible search for truth, may we covenant to honor the many paths that have led us to this community. Now, as I light my own chalice here at home, you are welcome to share lighting your own chalice wherever you are, either virtually or actually. Now please join me with our chalice lighting words by the Reverend Peter Samowski of the Prague Unitarian Church in the Czech Republic. May this flame we light remind us that every one of us can bring the light of love to the world. May this clear flame be a symbol that every heart can burn bright with joy peace, and harmony. May the wisdom of ages speak to us through this flame and stay in us. Every one of us can be a blessing to the world. Every one of us can be a blessing to the world. 
very true. And that transitions really nicely into the book that I'm going to share with you this morning. One of the things we're thinking about today in this service is whose voices are heard, who is seen, who is left out of things, um, and what is what happens when that's true. So this is a book called Bodies Are Cool uh, by Tyler Fetter. And the thing that I love about it is that it shows a variety of bodies um, that, that that is unlike anything I have, I mean, even come close to seeing in a picture book before. So I'm gonna read it just, I'm, I'm gonna read it and then just have a little pause of leaving the picture up just for a moment. There's so much in it. I know you're not gonna capture it all. Um, seeing me do it this way, but I think you'll you'll capture some of it. CVU US owns this book. Um, this is a book that I actually strongly recommend every family with kids owns. And it's a fabulous book to get as a present also. If there's a child in your life that you're gonna get a book for, it's really pretty amazing. Um, so I encourage you while I read to really try to look at the pictures as much as you can. Um, and if you can't see the pictures, that's fine. Then just listen to my voice and imagine. Um, and see if you can find yourself on the pages in this book or people that you know, and if there's anything that really jumps out at you. So here we go. Bodies are cool. Tyler, by the way, um, not that this really matters, but I think it surprised me, um, is uh, female and uses she, her pronouns. I read the entire book thinking it had been written by somebody male, which was an assumption I shouldn't have made. So I just wanted to share that with you. Bodies are cool. And this is her down in the right-hand corner. You can see a little arrow. There she is. Big bodies, small bodies, dancing, playing, happy bodies. Look at all these different bodies. Bodies are cool. Lanky bodies, squat bodies, tall, short, wide, or narrow bodies, somewhere in the middle bodies, bodies are cool. Round bodies, muscled bodies, curvy curves and straight bodies, jiggly, wiggly, fat bodies, bodies are cool. Dark skin, olive skin, every shade of brown skin, pinky pale or peach skin, bodies are cool. Poofy hair, wavy hair, springy curls and flat hair, lots of hair or no hair, bodies are cool. Leg hair, armpit hair, fuzzy lip and chin hair, brows meet in the middle hair, bodies are cool. Hazel eyes, brown eyes, monolids and round eyes, blind and wearing glasses eyes, bodies are cool. Crooked faces, bump nosed faces, flat nose, full lips, gap toothed faces, stick out ears and thin lip faces, bodies are cool. Freckled bodies, dotted bodies, 
rosy patched or speckled bodies, dark skin swirled with light bodies, with light skin bodies. Bodies are cool. Hairy fingers, wrinkly fingers, dimpled elbows, chubby fingers, wobbly arms and stubby fingers. Bodies are cool. Soft tummies, saggy tummies, flat or sticky outy tummies, innies, outies, pregnant tummies. Bodies are cool. This is probably my favorite page. Thick legs, scrawny legs, knobby knees and long legs, roll up to the table legs. Bodies are cool. Faint scars, bold scars, stripes from getting bigger scars, marks that tell a story scars. Bodies are cool. This body, that body, his and her and their body. However you define your body, bodies are cool. Growing bodies, aging bodies, Features rearranging bodies, magic ever changing bodies. Bodies are cool. And I'll just point out this was not obvious to me in my first read. Maybe it is to you that the people on the right in this picture are all the same people from the left um, when they've gotten older. And some of them have gone through some pretty big changes. that you can see. I think all of them have probably gone through big changes that you can't see. My body, your body, every different kind of body, all of them are good bodies. Bodies are cool. So <laughs> I share this because um, representation matters and what that means to um, younger people is seeing yourself matters, right? Um, there's this idea that in books, in picture books, especially for kids, we want them to be mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. And so think about this as an adult for a second. Just hear this, hear me through. Um, or, or a kid if you're listening to me. Mirror. So mirror means you see yourself, right? So think for a moment when you were growing up or in movies, in books, um, in fashion, in stores, um, did you see people that looked like you? That's what that means, right? A mirror is you can look around and you can see somebody that looks like you in in books and movies and TV shows and the thing the kinds of things you might look at, posters on walls of classrooms. So that's that's what a mirror is. Windows. Windows means there's a window that you can look through and see into other people's lives, right? So you're not necessarily seeing yourself, you're looking through and seeing other people, other cultures, other skins, other bodies, other accents, other lifestyles, other families, whatever that might be, other political beliefs. Sliding glass doors, <laughs> this one was added a little later, to this metaphor, sliding glass door means it's like a window, 
right? You can look into it and see somebody's life, but you can actually open it and walk into it. So you can join it. You can imagine yourself there. You can see yourself in it. Um, so what we're looking for in the world, I would say, is that everybody is able to look around and see themselves, right? Mirror and see other people and imagine themselves in other places, put themselves in somebody else's shoes. So the thought I'll leave you with as you go into this week, especially if you're somebody who um, buys picture books for kids or has them in your house um, or reads them with your parents is notice the kind of books you have and think about if you think in your house, it would be useful or as presents to get the kids you know more books that are mirrors so that the kids you know need to see themselves more or windows, do they need to see other people more or sliding glass doors? They can see other people and they can imagine, they can really go into that and imagine that. I think we all need a mix, but the people who are held up a lot in this culture, right, white, able-bodied, straight, um, often male still, um, we see ourselves mirrored a lot. So for me, I needed more books that were windows. So go out into the world, notice what you notice. And if you see that things are missing, see if you can bring more of that to the world, especially in things you buy, where you buy things, what you give to people, what you lift up. So my darlings, thank you for this time together. And now we're going to go to the offering. Poppy, thanks so much for that great introduction to the offering and to the rest of the service where we're going to be thinking about uh, mirroring windows, sliding doors through time as we look at how to read the Bible. Um, before that, though, this is our last chance this month to uh, share our offering with the part of UNICEF that deals with getting vaccination uh, to the parts of the world where they're very, way behind the curve in protecting their people from COVID. And uh, this is important as a expression of compassion for people who have been shut out of many of the early rounds of vaccination, but it's also for our own good because it's out of those parts of the world that new variants are more likely to come and delay the time where we can be back together. So for both uh, giving reasons and for selfish reasons, I invite you to be as generous as you're able uh, in this offering. Thanks, Ronnie. I have a number of milestones today to share with you. The first comes from Doug Richards and Colleen Brown. And Doug and Colleen want to share that Colleen's parents, who've had a really rough six months and a very rough last month, are finally both settled into comfortable 
caring living arrangements. Uh, Colleen's mom, Esther, is in an independent living apartment at the residence at Otter Creek. And Father Hank is in the memory care apartment at Garden Song Unit of Eastview. Colleen is grateful to have her parents so close and in settings that meet their needs. And um, her father's Alzheimer's disease has progressed very significantly lately, and it needed much more skilled care than either uh, Colleen's mom or, or Colleen and Doug could provide. Colleen and Doug are enormously grateful to all of the CVUUS friends who've been so helpful and supportive of them and um, Colleen's mom, Esther, over this challenging time. They are feeling very, very blessed. Um, we have a message from Rosalie Cryan, says she's sad to report that her uncle Paul Cryan um, died January 20th at the age of 99 years, six months. Uh, he's a kind and generous man. Rosalie said she'll miss him. And he was the last surviving um, member of a family of eight siblings, the last link to her father's generation. Her observation is time marches on. And uh, this is one of those events that makes us all feel it. Thank you, Rosalie, for sharing. Rich Wilson uh, sent in a message in memory of David Raphael of Panton, a prominent landscape architect who worked in Vermont and beyond. Many of you may have seen the obituary uh, in the recent Addison Independent. Um, David and his wife, Diane, were involved with this congregation in its very early days, according to Rich. And they're listed among the 28 entries in the very first CVUUS directory dated February, 1986. And Rich adds, he's pretty sure that he and Bill Sessions had their son, Jory, in the RE class at Sarah Partridge House in East Middlebury. And much later, around 2010, Jory and his wife, Stacey, were briefly involved with CVUUS as members. So, um, having got this from Rich, I sent a little note to, to Jory uh, saying that we would be marking this milestone today. And uh, Jory wrote back that he was really pleased. And I think I saw uh, on the arrivers in Zoom that um, they tuned in uh, for this. So um, welcome, uh, welcome back for today. And I'm really glad that Rich shared this piece of our history that a lot of us who are newer members or congregants uh, weren't aware of. And um, finally, um, Ellen Flight um, says that um, she wants us to remember the 49th and possibly last anniversary of Roe v. Wade today. Um, it's a great concern and sadness for her that this could be overturned, this Supreme Court decision. She's especially concerned for the women already limited in their access who already need to make the hard decisions between legal safe abortion and less safe abortions which put them at greater risk. There are many nuances involved in a decision to end a pregnancy and women and families need to be able to make their own choices, Ellen says. Um, I'll, I'll simply say that, um, thank you for submitting this. Uh, although people are free to remark on current events, that doesn't happen too often in our milestones. And just as a legal matter, uh, if it's possible, Ellen, I invite you to think that the uh, it can't be the last anniversary. It may be the last year that it's the law of the land, but a Supreme Court decision, um, like an actual uh, pregnancy and birth of a human being, once it happens in the universe, can't be undone and the ripples go on forever. So uh, Roe v. Wade will be there as part of our legal history and influencing legal thought, um, even if it gets overturned. There is one more uh, milestone I wanted to mark today, and I'll use it um, to uh, offer a prayer to lead us into our time of silence when um, we get in touch with what's on our hearts before we move on to the rest of the service. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh died this week, one of the, the world's great spiritual leaders. And I wanna share um, this prayer poem to lead us into our time of silence. It's from his book, A Pebble for Your Pocket. Precious gems are everywhere in the cosmos and inside every one of us. I want to offer a handful to you, my dear friend. Yes, this morning, I want to offer a handful to you, a handful of diamonds that glow from morning to evening. Each minute of our daily life is a diamond that contains sky and earth, sunshine and river. 
we only need to breathe gently for the miracle to be revealed. Birds singing, flowers blooming. Here is the blue sky, here is the white cloud floating. Your lovely look, your beautiful smile, all these are contained in one jewel. You who are the richest person on earth and behave like a destitute son, please come back to your heritage. Let us offer each other happiness and learn to dwell in the present moment. Let us cherish life in our two arms and let go of our forgetfulness and despair. And now we have some music bringing us into the latter part of our service and into some considerations about the Bible. Children, 
the devil's a villain, but it ain't necessarily so. To get into heaven, don't snap for a seven. Live clean, don't have no faults. Oh, I takes the gospel whenever it's possible, but with a grain of salt. Methuselah lived 900 years. But who calls that living when nobody will give in to no man what's 900 years? I'm preaching this sermon to show it ain't Nessa. Ain't this a, ain't this a, ain't this a, ain't this a serenity so Our ancient reading from the book of Genesis, the first of the Bible's 66 books, tells a small piece of the famously ambiguous story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or else you will be consumed in the punishment of the city. But he lingered, so the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and left him outside the city. When they had brought them outside, they said, flee for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the hills or else you will be consumed. And Lot said to them, oh no, my lords, your servant has found favor with you and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life, but I cannot flee to the hills for fear the disaster will overtake me and I die. Look, that city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. He said to him, very well. I grant you this favor too, and will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. Therefore, the city was called Zor. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Our modern reading by Anna Amatova, originally written in Russian, is one of the many poems imagining what motivated Lot's wife to look back. It's called Lot's Wife. And the just man trailed God's shining agent over a black mountain in his giant track while a restless voice kept harrying his woman. It's not too late. You can still look back at the red towers of your native Sodom, the square where once you sang the spinning shed at the empty windows set in the tall house where sons and daughters blessed your marriage bed. A single glance, a sudden dart of pain, stitching her eyes before she made a sound, her body flaked into transparent salt and her swift legs rooted to the ground. Who will grieve for this woman? 
Does she not seem too insignificant for our concern? Yet, in my heart, I never will deny her who suffered death because she chose to turn. Thank you, Martha. There's an old joke about the Unitarian Universalist Church with a sign outside that said, Bible study tonight, bring scissors. <laughs> and that is clearly one way you use and skeptics who sometimes identify with us approach this ancient collection of religious texts. It's nothing new. Most famously, perhaps, there was Thomas Jefferson, known from his letters to be a Unitarian in private and a despiser of beliefs in a God who acts through supernatural miracles. In 1804, Jefferson constructed a collection of Jesus's moral teachings, which he laboriously cut out from his Bible. In 1820, he again wielded razor, and, razor blades and paste to create the so-called Jefferson Bible, a more extensive collection of everything he found in the gospels and other parts of the New Testament that reflected the ethics, daily life, and teachings of Jesus. I haven't read the Jefferson Bible in a long time, but I've read some commentaries that claim he excluded every biblical reference to supernatural miracles, to Jesus being God, to faith healing, angels, heaven, hell, the Holy Spirit, the devil, or resurrection. The reporter in me wonders whether he actually got all of them, but it does sound about right. That's the impression I retain from when I read it. At any rate, Jefferson called his work The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth. It ran to 46 pages. He used it for personal study in the evening instead of the Christian Bible. To end it, he cut off the last two chapters of the Gospel of John, so that his last passage reads simply, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new sepulcher. They there they laid Jesus and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. End of story. One wonders naturally how this unusual approach to reading the Bible squared with Jefferson's conscience about his enslavement of black people. He was a practitioner and enabler of slavery throughout his life, despite advocating for changes that he felt would gradually lead to its demise. He spoke publicly of it as a moral depravity, hideous, and a threat to the survival of the United States. His transgressions in this realm weren't minor. He owned and profited from the work of more than 600 enslaved people over the course of his life. Almost none of them were granted freedom while he owned them or in his will. His human property included at least six children he had with Sally Hemings, a light-skinned family maid who originally came into his life as a toddler owned by his wife, Martha. So here's what I'm left with. We know how Jefferson read Christianity's Bible from how he cut it up, but how did he read his own Bible when it came to life and death matters for those around him? All those evenings when he poured over those stories and teachings by the fire or candle or whale oil lamplight, was he reading for permission to violate what he saw as the laws of nature condemning slavery? Or was he seeking guidance on how to save his soul? Did he believe the meaning of his life depended in some way on what he could learn? I wonder sometimes what Jefferson would have said, had he lived long enough to have read these words about Bibles from Walt Whitman's famous poem, Leaves of Grass, which are just about the only explicit mention of Bibles in our hymnal readings. I do not say they are not divine. I say they have all grown out of you and may grow out of you still. It is not they who give the life. It is you who give the life. So I'll come right out with my prejudice at this point. I think Jefferson's approach to the Bible failed him. You can never extract life-saving truth from cutting up a Bible. You inadvertently cut up too many vital questions. Whether you do it physically as Jefferson did or mentally, that strategy of slice it up until it only says or 
appears to say what you agree with is actually a barrier to something that we, you use, claim as vital to our religion. Our fourth principle, affirming and promoting a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Here's a little story that can lead us forward past the potentially numbing generality of those words in our fourth principle. It comes from a British rabbi named Jonathan Magomed. In 1968, a Jewish youth group with which he was involved hosted a group of Jews visiting from Czechoslovakia for a conference in Scotland. The Czechs planned to stay on for a week of being tourists, but that turned out to be the week that Russia and its Warsaw Pact allies invaded their homeland to put down a reform movement that threatened communist control of the country. The turmoil pinned the students down in England as refugees. And so Magnet became part of a Bible study program to help them fill their days. He was astonished at the nuances they discovered in the Bible passages everyone studied together, especially when they told him they never did anything like that at home, no Bible study. How is that possible, he asked them. It's easy, they explained. At home, under communist rule, of course, there was no freedom of the press. When anyone read a newspaper, the first thing they looked at was what was written. Then you had to say to yourself, if that's what they've written, what really happened? And if that's what really happened, what are they trying to make us think? And if that's what they're trying to make us think, what should we be thinking instead? Thus, the student said, you learn to read between and behind the lines. In short, you learn to read a newspaper as if your life depended on understanding it, because it did. So that's why I want to explore how to read the Bible. I want to read the Bible as if your church, our church is one with a sign out front that says, Bible study tonight, it is you who give the life. The Bible tells you often in amazing detail about people's experiences of each other in times of turmoil and disaster. Some of the stories are highly personal. Others speak of the fate of nations or even all known humans. All of them, as they understood it, also reflected in one way or another the relationships between people and divine forces outside of their control. The Bible stories, like scripture from other sources, reflect many centuries of historical events wrapped up in poetic visions of what to make of them. Indeed, if you consider that many were grounded in oral tradition and songs that were passed on long before they were written down, some of these stories reflect encounters with our ancestors' greatest concerns going back thousands of years. And beyond that, they come down to us with commentary over a 2,000 year span of many of the greatest, or at least most influential minds in human history, looking at how they read the Bible. Serious study of these stories can give us a way to talk to each other about present dilemmas that can be both safer and less restrictive than trying to get at the truth in present tense alone. You can talk about what really matters to you through some of these stories without getting all tied up in disagreements about how you interpret current events. Before I promise too much, let me say that we can't do serious Bible study on Zoom this morning. I learned in seminary that what really is going on in a Bible story can only be hinted at in a short sermon. Ideally, there are related physical activities and music, and times of eating and playing that let your creative juices steep and side conversations about the story bubble up. What we are doing now is not an ideal format for deep personal sharing. But let's at least shine a flashlight into the dark surrounding this subject for you use, many of whom gave up on reading the Bible long ago. Now, I'm going to say that we thought maybe we would play around with the Zoom poll um, and ask a question about how many people have read the Bible in the last month, yes or no, and maybe a third option of, I would have if I could have found a copy in my house. Um, 
I'm just going to, since we aren't going to do the poll, I'm just going to ask people to raise your hands if and wave if you read a Bible passage in the last month. And uh, we'll see how deep into the Bible um, this congregation is. I'm going to quickly switch to gallery view so I can see some responses. And I'm not seeing many hands waving. So I think it's fair to say most UUs are not really operating in the Bible world. I'm fairly sure, though, that almost all of you have heard of Sodom and Gomorrah. Some of you have even some sense of what the biblical story is. That's most likely because it is so often trotted out as a biblical condemnation of homosexuality. Every time there's a major Supreme Court decision involving gay or lesbian rights or some other news event about abuse directed at the LGBTQ plus community, social media goes wild with mentions of Sodom and Gomorrah. What's happening here is that in effect, people are slicing a couple of phrases out of the Sodom and Gomorrah story and telling us what it has to mean, what the whole story has to mean. They are not asking, what does the whole text say? Who wrote it? In whose voices is it being told? What do the characters want us to believe? What does the writer or writers want us to believe? What do we think really happened or might have happened? What might have happened? Why might it have happened that way? Whose voice has been left out? What do we think they might say? What information has been left out? When does this story actually begin? Take a deep breath here. And I'm just gonna add two more questions that occur. I believe these questions would have to be part of any UU Bible study of this story. Depending on our answers, what use of the Sodom and Gomorrah story could affirm and promote life-giving love? What use is destructive in a way that we can't imagine sitting well with a loving God, much less with our own conscience? Well, that's enough questions for it to be clear, I hope, that I have no intention of going deeply into this story. I recently came across an online video of my Hebrew Bible teacher in seminary talking brilliantly about this one story for over an hour. During that talk, she suggested answers to some of the questions above and showed how the story looked at in total included other references to it in the Bible, speaks to all kinds of current events, the treatment of women and children, terrorism, immigration, the behavior of then President Trump at the time she made the speech. If you truly studied the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, you might have a sense that our ancestors left us with more tools to build a better world than you realized. Since our theme this month is exploring, how do we know what we know? I'll pause here to say that this is one of those stories, like a good spy novel where deceptions lurk everywhere. It's one of those stories that Mark Twain might have had in mind when he said, well, when one reads the Bibles, one is less surprised by what the deity knows than of what he doesn't know. Or as he said on another occasion, the Bible is full of interest. It has noble poetry in it and some clever fables. It has some blood drenched history, some good morals, a wealth of obscenity and upwards of a thousand lies. More than other books, the Bible invites you to ask how what looks like a lie might actually be a form of truth, or what looks like stupidity is, all things considered, a relatively wise response. How can I read this so that I account for what's written and still see something life-supporting happening? This is an incredibly valuable practice for how to live in our world without losing hope, for how to live as one of the helpers Fred Rogers' mother told him to look for whenever there is trouble or pain. A story that he often repeated on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. That said, I think the best use of our remaining time would be to look at just one tiny piece of the Sodom and Gomorrah story where everyone agrees the truth has been told. The cities are about to be destroyed. Two angels are trying to hustle a man named Lot and his immediate family to safety. Why? 
Lot happens to be Abraham's nephew by blood and also through adoption. When Lot's father died, his brother. It helps to know that God has selected Abraham and his descendants to be the foundation of God's relationship with humanity. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam will all trace their roots back to Abraham. Lot's not as righteous as Abraham. Indeed, he's sort of a spiritual klutz, but he's basically well-intentioned and obedient. He skates through most of the messes he ends up in with God's help, which seems to be extended for Abraham's sake, if nothing else. In our reading, the angels get Lot's family out of Sodom before calling down the fire and brimstone that will destroy it. Not all of the family, two older daughters elect to stay with their husbands in Sodom, elect or had no choice to leave. Anyway, the angels provide at least one last warning that you heard in our ancient reading. Flee for your life, do not look back or stop anywhere in the plain, flee to the hills or else you will be consumed. Then there's a long passage where Lot bargains for a little bit different result where he can go to a little town nearby and he gets God's approval for that. Then they move on and Lot's wife can't stop herself. She's trailing behind. She looks back and is immediately turned into a pillar of salt. As I said, the truth was told. Death was the price of looking back. She paid it. But now the questions begin. Why does the translation I found say consumed and another that I found says swept away when she is in fact Neither. She is transformed into a geological formation, a kind of geological formation still common today in the region where Sodom is thought to have been. Why is this minor character killed in a way that anyone hearing the story in biblical times would be invited to view it as enduring testimony to the price for not listening to a warning from God's angels? Who wants us to believe Lot's wife is guilty of some major transgression instead of simply being human, looking back at the place of her birth, the place where all of her life unfolded, the place where two daughters remained with their husbands while her two other daughters, unmarried as of yet, are in the party fleeing. Is it Lot's wife who is being punished or Lot? The story demands more information and rabbis have added different ideas over the centuries of why her transgressions might have been more than simply looking back in commentaries. They're trying to justify what happened to her. In modern times, readers looking at the story through the lens of unjust treatment of women and children in the story have returned again and again to Lot's wife. Some, like the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova in our second reading, have totally rejected the idea that she should be seen as a symbol of just punishment. Who will grieve for this woman, she asks. And she rejects the idea that even though the storytellers never call Lot's wife by her name, this victim of whatever is going on is too insignificant to merit not just our attention, but our empathy. She simply won't buy that. Another poet who knew something about oppression, the Polish poet Wisława Zimborska wrote a much longer poem also called Lot's Wife. It starts with more than 20 reasons that she might have looked back and then begins listing accidents that might have turned her around without her willing it. And then Zimborska simply denies it happened before ending with utter confusion about the truth. She writes, no, no, I ran on, I crept, I flew upward until darkness fell from the heavens and with it scorching gravel and dead birds. I couldn't breathe and spun around and around. Anyone who saw me must have thought I was dancing. It's not inconceivable that my eyes were open. It's possible I fell facing the city. My point in bringing up this briefest of incidents within the story is to illustrate that something astounding can happen when we read the Bible seeking only one thing, to know more about what is possible when the goal is to be a people who give life to it. We are invited to hone our most loving questions against the Bible's answers. Is there any harm in ignoring this invitation? Take your time answering. The Bible isn't going anywhere without us. 
just like the God, it says, kicked us out of the Garden of Eden and then went everywhere we did. Blessed be and amen. Okay, everyone. Um, we're going to share a piece of music with you now um, that I kind of plucked out of the archives. Um, a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic started, the Middlebury College Choir, I was supposed to, for my senior work when I was a student there, conduct them on a performance, um, which got canceled. But right before they sent everybody home, we did an impromptu concert one afternoon. We just did everything as it was. Um, and one of the pieces we sang was a great spiritual called Witness um, that really uh, fits with today's theme. It goes through all the stories of Nicodemus and Samson and cutting off his hair and all of that. And then it ends with this big, who will be a witness? My soul will be a witness. Um, and uh, so here's the recording. As we go out into our communities carefully this week, or as we sit home dreaming of going out into our communities, I invite you to think about what we just saw. We heard something beautiful. We saw the passion. The words eluded most of us. And yet there's more life to the work that Ronnie and the choir did because we are we had the opportunity to see it, to feel that spirit, and to get in touch with the idea that witnessing is part of making the world better. It's the work you do, it's the work you witness so that the ripple effects move on. So 
as you go forth in making the life of the world out of all the different resources that are left to us, whether it's the Bible, the concert that didn't get sung to the public, or anything else you encounter, know that that is part of living a life of integrity and meaning, and that we will have the opportunity to come together and share those experiences as a congregation going forward and to grow from them. Blessed be. All right, and last piece of music for today. We kind of got shifted one place back in music today. So instead of a postlude, um, I'm just gonna invite you all to sing with me um, a hymn that everybody knows. Um, we'll have a hymn postlude, that's a new one. Um, anyway, the words will be on the screen. Rock. Mm -hmm. 